Welcome back to the Tom Hartman Program. I'm Alex Lawson, filling in for Tom, and I have the distinct pleasure of being joined in studio by Rebecca Vallis, the host of Talk Poverty Radio, the managing director of the poverty team at Center for American Progress. Rebecca, thanks for joining us. Alex, always a pleasure to be in your presence. So what should we talk about? Well, I, I've heard there might be a debate tonight. There Did I get is that a wrong? There's a debate tonight. Not that I'm, many people talking about I'm it. I'm hoping that people don't watch it. I said earlier, <laughs> like, no, you know, real people, you know, like, they should, it's for their mental health. Watch some baseball, um, you know, go outside, play, whatever it is. If you're in Vegas, obviously play craps. Don't watch the debate. Um, I, I because feel, they're not going to learn anything about the issues. That's not why you watch the debate, Alex. I think you've entirely missed the point. You now watch the debate so that you can compare Donald Trump's performance with Alec Baldwin's performance <laughs> as Donald Trump. No, and it, it, that it's, is, it's become so difficult to tell the two apart that that's actually why you really watch the debates now. He, do, it is, he does a really good job. He's got the lip thing it's down the lip thing. perfectly. It's this, like, this like thing he mm -hmm. does, and he just sort of looks... Like, it's, it's amazing. But I do think that what's missing from the debates is, I mean, like, I joke and everything, but it is just sad where it's gotten to, because the American people do not want to watch a reality TV um, weird thing that is called a debate. Um, they want to talk about the issues that affect them. Uh, we've spent the whole show talking about Social Security, because the COLA was just announced yesterday, as you know, 0.3%. Um, you know, we know that when there was the opportunity for the American people to vote on what they wanted to talk about, uh, Social Security expanding and not cutting Social Security was the third uh, most voted for uh, question. And the top two were both on guns. Uh, it was the NRA versus gun control groups kind of duking it out. Uh, but, you know, they obviously didn't talk about that. We know that Wallace, and we've talked a little bit, is going to talk about Social Security, but... He's going to do it for the greedy liars on Wall Street. And we already know exactly what's going to come up in tonight's debate if they do talk about Social Security, because the title of that section that's been promoted is, quote, debt and entitlements. And that says everything you need to know. It's not social insurance or paid benefits or programs that Americans really care about and love, right? They've given the away. things that Americans agree on. Right. There's no. only like four of them, but Social Security is like two of them. Do you even have four? Four is optimistic. I being optimistic. Uh, Maybe two. Pew actually did that <laughs> poll yes. on the increasing polarization, and the, the only one they found was Social Security. In fact, there's increasing polarization on everything except Social Security. Where people are uh, as confident as ever that what we need to do is expand the program. They're willing to pay more to see that happen because they know how vital a program it is. Um, and they're unified in saying that, no, we, we actually don't want to see benefit cuts. They know that's the wrong direction. But unfortunately, we still see a huge gap between what the American people know and understand and want and what we're actually hearing about in these debates. So I know you didn't actually want to talk about this too much. I wanted to. Uh, but you said, no, let's talk about Social Security. And I... Well, I like to make you happy, Alex. What I That's what do, I do. That's what, what I, I wanted to, to do. do was say <laughs> that you keep me honest. So yes. I spent the whole time talking about Social Security. We all agree that it's going to come up tonight. It's going to come up in a very uh, poor yeah. way. It's going to be a very loaded and biased question. I'm optimistic that Secretary Clinton is actually going to respond very strongly yeah. about the new center of the Democratic Party is expansion. Um, and who knows what Donald Trump's going to do? And um, she's been incredibly clear about that. Has, I mean, throughout the primary, throughout the general, she has been very clear that where her campaign believes we need to go when it comes to Social Security and ensuring that it remains strong for generations is expansion. Yeah. And that the I mean, like I joked years ago that when we got to the point of arguing how much to expand Social Security, we're going to be in a really good place. But that's literally where we are right now. That is exactly we're where we are. We're arguing about is should we, you know, across the board benefit increase or just targeted. So I, I am optimistic there. Um, I think Donald will do the weird thing with his lips and snort a lot. Um, sniff. Sniff. Well, he snorts before and then he sniffs on camera. It's the sniffing that's so weird. It's weird. It's like the fourth weird least weird thing though because the stalking is was, the most weird yes that well um, is that the most weird but not weird it's uh the, the most groping maybe is the most weird but but the stalking is definitely number two with the <laughs> sniffing not far behind not far behind <laughs> we are going to talk about social security i think 
it's going to be framed really poorly, but I don't think we're going to talk about uh, like any other program that Americans uh, love and rely on. And we're definitely not going to talk about poverty. Well, so I'm going to be the optimist here. So oh, first, good. starting with Social Security, because I think you're right, we are going to hear about that. And and I know you've been talking a lot about that today on the program, and I, I'm shocked to hear that that's the case, given that you don't, what do you know about Social Security? But no, but seriously, I, I think- I'm a recognized social insurance expert. You, a, a, noted, a noted, a noted, self-styled mm -hmm. social insurance expert. You are indeed, as am I, actually. That's, that's something we have in common. But um, but in all in all seriousness, I think we are indeed going to hear that come up. I think the question is going to be framed poorly. I think exactly as you said, we're going to hear a very clear uh, vision from the Hillary Clinton campaign about what they think needs to happen. And that's expansion. That's especially making sure that women um, and low income workers uh, can have dignity in retirement and making sure that we invest in Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share to make sure that that happens for generations to come. What I really hope the moderator ends up doing tonight, I think it's Chris Wallace, right? Mm -hmm. What I challenge Chris, and Chris, if you're watching, what I challenge you to do is not to let Donald Trump away uh, with this whole, well, I'm not going to cut benefits or, or just, you know, the same kind of uh, uh, jello-like message that he sent on every other issue. What's really important is to pin him down and say, well, wait a second, you've told us that you actually want to give massive tax cut giveaways to the wealthy, to corporations, to the tune of $6 trillion over 10 years. And what does that mean for the rest of the economy? What does that mean for how you're going to pay for that? Because you, Mr. Trump, have said that's going to be paid for. Well, I think we need to push him and the moderator needs to push him to answer how he's going to pay for that. Because absent some other piece of information, um, the only way he's going to be able to do that is going to be across the board cuts in essentially not all non-interest spending, um, a 13.5% um, of uh, across the board cut. And, and that's potentially, according to new analysis from the Center for American Progress, going to include massive, massive cuts to Social Security and Medicare. And we need to hear him speak to how he's going to do both. I already early in the program um, tried to make a wager with somebody that Chris Wallace was not going to do that because <laughs> there's just no way he's it's Fox News. They're going to like maybe push him a little bit. He's going to say something about China uh, and China, China. making America great, and that's it. And yes. they're going to just let him off the hook with that. And then he's probably going to like go on some weird uh, rant about something. Um, who knows? But it's going to be whatever Roger Stone tweeted last night at four in the morning when he was on his benders. Uh, that's what Donald Trump's going to talk about. But why aren't we going to talk about? Um, I mean, the Clinton campaign put out some really great policies recently. They're definitely not going to get talked about. Um, well, I mean, I think we'll see. Back to why I'm optimistic. I think what we have seen from the Clinton campaign is an incredibly clear message that we need to tackle income inequality and particularly that it, poverty is a, both a moral ec and an economic scourge in this country that we can't afford to continue to let to persist. And uh, what we actually heard um, uh, out of her campaign just last week was some very specific policy about what we're going to do to make sure that child poverty is no longer something at the rates that it exists at today. So after this break, I want to get into the specifics on those policies. Um, we're going to continue this discussion with Rebecca Vallis, the host of Talk Poverty Radio, uh, right after this quick break. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. We're going to be right back continuing our discussion with Rebecca Vallis on uh, what specific policies to reduce poverty the Clinton campaign has put forward. Stick And we're back. We're going to try to get through some of these calls here. I'm going in order. Um, let me go to Al uh, from Birmingham, Alabama. Al, thanks for calling in. You're on the air. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. This is Alex sitting in for Tom, but I take that as a great compliment. Oh, Alex, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> You're on the air with uh, Alex and Rebecca Vallis, host of Talk Poverty Radio. 
Well, okay, I hadn't turned on my television. I just called in to make the comment. Uh, I said, I find it interesting that um, the Trump campaign is uh, harping on uh, Benghazi and going to bring the mother of one of the deceased to uh, to the debate. Um, and essentially, the Republicans were in charge of the Senate and the House, and the State Department had already asked for additional funds for security, which they denied. So I don't know why they're putting the burden upon uh, Hillary at this point in time. That's a great point, Al. Um, that's all, all of that is true, but it's just, you know, th th this is the kind of um, reality TV politics that Donald Trump plays. Um, so, and the media is definitely not doing their job in trying to actually keep this on uh, the issues in any way, shape, or form. Rebecca, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. I think reality television is exactly the model and the only model that, that Donald Trump knows how to play. He's producing a show. It's one night he's decided he's going to bring multiple women that were entangled at some point with Bill Clinton to the to the debate to make some sort of a, a send a signal when he himself is the one out there talking to Billy Bush, bragging about him, his own sexual assault history. Um, he's a serial philanderer, serial philanderer uh, which cheated on every one of his wives, is on his third marriage. Not right? aware of the hypocrisy there. Tonight he's talking about how he's going to bring uh, Barack Obama's brother to the debate to remind everyone about the birth certificate kerfuffle that Donald Trump started and perpetuated for years. So this is this is the only kind of politics he, he knows about. It's actually, you know, like the media is not going to do their job. There's just no way. Um, Chris Wallace is not going to do his job. The this media. isn't just the media. This is Fox News we're talking about. It's true. Um, if Shep Smith was there, and I think he is involved in some way, if Shep Smith is there, then I have a little bit more faith that we're going to get some news. But um, otherwise, none at all. The the. The difficulty I see and why I, I seriously don't think that it you get much from watching the debates is that there are two things going on. Hillary Clinton is running for president. She wants to be the president of the United States of America, uh, a, a very, a, a massive amount of responsibility. And she understands what that responsibility is. And she's taking it seriously. And she's taking it seriously. The duty, uh, the it, it, this that's what she's doing and then you have this other dude uh who is running a reality tv show and obviously since they're playing different games it doesn't actually tell you anything except that donald trump is a buffoon um at, well what he actually is he's, he's a golden toilet stuffed with garbage that's lit on fire rolling down a mountain of garbage, and it's spewing that fire and lighting that mountain on fire. All of that is true. I disagree with none of that. But also, we have to remember to take it seriously as voters because he's not just a buffoon. He's also a great risk to this country, and we need to not forget that. And I don't think we are. We're going to be right back uh, after this. Welcome back to the Tom Hartman program. I'm Alex Lawson, filling in for Tom. I'm joined in studio by Rebecca Vallis. She is the host of Talk Poverty Radio. Uh, we were just talking uh, during the break. Uh, About golden toilets. Yes, Donald to Trump. To be precise. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the fifth time I've said that. So um, I think people are aware that's what I think of Donald Trump. To pay covered to, golden toilets. Yeah, it's a gilded one. It's, it's not actually <laughs> golden. It's just... Uh, it. I thought we were going to talk about the issues, off. Alex. Well, that's where we're going because oh, you again <laughs> kept me honest, and you made uh, you made the point that yeah. he is a buffoon. But it's a very serious. We're, we are one of the two of them is going to be the next president of the United States of America. Um, so Hillary Clinton has put out some amazing policies lately that are just lost yeah. in uh, the reality TV show Donald Trump is running. That's what I want you to tell us about right now: um, the child care credit. So, Alex, just a minute ago, we were talking about just how clear the contrast is between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump when it comes to Social Security, despite what he would want voters to believe um, and despite some of the messaging he, he, out, he laid out during the primaries. The contrast is also incredibly 
clear when it comes to um, to poverty and to inequality. And so just to, to remind people of some not too distant history, Donald Trump is the man who, with all seriousness, said in the same interview that he wanted to be the head of a workers party. I don't know if he knows what that meant, but he said it. And then he also said about four sentences later, and wages in this country are too high. That is what he thinks about income inequality. And of course, it's no surprise because he could not be more distant and more out of touch with what an average American experiences every single day. He's he's the CEO being paid 400 times what his workers are being paid. And in large part because he's stealing from them at, at every turn, he, as we've seen. He made his money the old fashioned way. He inherited it. That's exactly right. He took a small loan from his father that he never intended to pay back. And that was actually huge, or should I say huge. So point being, contrast, right, with uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, not just her much more realistic and modest upbringing, right, which I, I think sometimes, you know, gets um, uh, made fun of, oh, she's mentioning her father and what he did and making drapes. But it really is. It's a very serious difference, the way the way that they, they grew up. And the same with, with Tim Kaine um, uh, having a, a modest upbringing that informs his values. And what we've really seen, and this is the important contrast, I think, what we've really seen in recent weeks is a doubling down on a commitment not just to tackle income inequality generally, um, but also to address poverty. And that's not something that politicians often feel confident or safe. You're being very generous about. there, because the reason I wanted you to come on is because politicians never talk about poverty, right. and because they, they know it, if they talk about poverty, it's a quote unquote loser. Their consultants will be like, "Don't do it. Don't talk about poverty. It's not a winner, um, right?" I mean, and don't say the p word. Don't say that's the, the p word, that and that's them. why you you really hear a lot of things about uh it's all work and and uh these are consultant tested messages and i it's just true that for far too long talking about poverty it wasn't always that way we used to have a war on poverty we used to see poverty as something that should be tackled through policy, yep. which is exactly what you should do, we should do as a nation. Well, it's been 51, 52 years since that war was declared, and I'm not a huge fan of all of the belligerent terminology, right? I don't know that we need a war on poverty, but we certainly need concentrated, focused attention and an ambitious agenda. And that's oh, what we- way better than war. Concentrated, focused attention and an ambitious agenda. I'm, I'm sorry, Alex, you're breaking up. You <laughs> loved my, uh, my my shift there in messaging. Oh, thank you, appreciate that. So, but but in all seriousness, the, the agenda that we've seen out of not just the Democratic Party and its platform, but also specifically out of Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign has been incredibly ambitious and brave for those reasons when it comes to poverty. So just most recently, Recently, last week, she unveiled a major proposal to harness the child tax credit. That's a, a very important piece of the tax code that uh, uh, gives about $1,000 per child uh, to families. Um, and and it, it is uh, an, a very important part of working families' um, financial security. What she's proposed to do is to say, you know what, let's take that successful program, which has a lot of bipartisan support since its history, um, or throughout its history, Let's take that and let's actually use that as a tool for fighting poverty by making sure that families at the bottom who currently aren't actually helped by that policy the way it's it's constructed, let's reform that program so that those families are able to be helped. And let's especially do that when it comes to very young kids, given what we know about child poverty and its long lasting um, effects on health, on educational outcomes, on employment outcomes. And so that's a really important policy proposal that unfortunately has gotten almost no notice because the media is just doing its horse race thing, talking right. almost entirely about Donald Trump and his parade of sexual assault. And the because the Trumpian reality show goes on, we are losing the fact that there are significant shifts in a very good direction that are happening within the Democratic Party. The that I, I I don't think that everyone is just new to this stuff, but there's an openness to declare uh, a moral reason to address poverty, a moral reason to address income inequality, that, that we're not scared of that. Uh, and, you know, I, I've never been, but I don't have a bunch of consultants always yelling at me for this stuff, and that's what politi politicians are faced with. But 
right now there's a change. There's a moment in this country where people are sick and tired of the inequality, of the upward redistribution of wealth. And, and these policies that we're seeing, a, a speech by Tim Kaine again, these are things that are clear clarion declarations of where the policy focus is, would be in a, in a Clinton administration. That's exactly right, Alex. And I think part of what you've seen is um, a real shift away from this Fox News misconception of what poverty looks like in America, which is us and them, people on the wrong side of the tracks, some uh, idea of a, a stagnant class of right. the poor who are poor year in and year out because of some kind of bad decision. That's what Fox News likes to paint. It's those people on the couch eating bonbons. And the reality, and it's not pretty to think about, but I think it's the reality that Americans have really come to understand, especially post-recession, when so many people were feeling the effects of job loss, uh, of, of home foreclosures and so forth, is poverty isn't about us and them. Poverty and, and economic hardship are widely shared mainstream life experiences that because we have an economy that's only working for those at the top of the economic ladder, the rest of us are all subject to those experiences. Because we have only one political party agreeing that we need paid leave and shouldn't be the only developed country that doesn't have it, that we need a higher minimum wage so, so that people aren't— Push on the one part, I think, mm -hmm. that you— explained very well that poverty happens to people over their lifetime, right? It's not a, a, a identifier and then it's permanent. That's exactly right. So when you actually look at the numbers, not to get too wonky here, but sometimes numbers can Tom be our Hartman's friends. Show You can get wonky. Well, you, that you've emboldened me. Here I go. We'll do some wonk spelunking. So um, when you actually look at the numbers, what you find is that about half of Americans are gonna experience at least one year of being poor or teetering right on the edge of financial insecurity um, at some point in their working years. And that when you actually include being unemployed for a year or needing to turn to the safety net for at least a year, that number rises to four out of five Americans. That's most of us. That's not us and them, that's, that's us. We're all in this together and it's something that we all need to be concerned about. And uh, you know, this is, uh I'm hopeful that this discussion is happening. And I think actually uh, younger folks are more, they face the brunt of this recession. So they're seeing this uh, every day. They're the ones still living with their parents because they can't get jobs despite college education. Exactly. But despite doing exactly what, you know, people are told to do. Uh, so, and they're demanding change, big change. Uh, so I am hopeful. Uh, except that Wallace is going to do a good job. Uh, but Rebecca Vallis, the host of Talk Poverty Radio, uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you all for listening to me, filling in for Tom. I'm going to be back uh, tomorrow, and we can, we can kind of check how we did uh, after the debate. Uh, but I'm Alex Lawson, filling in for Tom Hartman on the Tom Hartman program. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you again tomorrow.